And I'm always blown away how people are able to open up, you know, and talk about their mental health problems. And um, one thing that I've learned over the years is that everybody, nobody's exempt, no matter how good, how, how good and shiny it looks on the outside. Lots of people are going through it. And when we give those kind of talks, we normalize it. We remove yeah. the stigma and the shame. And people open up when they realize that I'm not alone. It's not just me because it's easy for a kid or even an adult to think, oh, I'm the only one going through this. It's just me. Something must be wrong with me. I'm so ashamed of it. All my other, my other colleagues and my peers, they're very strong. Nothing is happening in their lives. But it's not true. Just because they're not talking about it. So I think that's a good way of doing it. I mean, maybe if it's once a fortnight or once a month, have kids come to either do it by Zoom like we're doing now or even meet up with the kids. Let's have a talk, you know, open discussion like kind of thing. Somebody will give a talk, then throw the floor open and invite kids to talk. You talk about your own experience or you bring an athlete to talk about his or her own experience. You'll be surprised at how these kids will open up when they realize that I am not alone. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And that's a good way of doing it, you know. Bring somebody to talk. I mean, do you know that investment banks and Fortune 500 companies, they have in-house psychologists, sometimes psychiatrists, that give regular talks to these people because they realize that for these adults to achieve their maximum potential at work, which will do the company good, they have to have intact mental health. So companies are taking it seriously now. They pay for, for them to go to psychiatrists. Even psychiatric hospitals, we have therapists. We have an external counselor that we say, okay, this is independent from the hospital. Our staff can go there. As a psychiatrist, we are encouraged to have regular therapy. You know, even a psychiatrist, we are encouraged to do that regularly. You know, so I think it's a good thing. It's um, it will have lots of benefits, not only for the kids, for them as athletes, but even for their for the for they're competing for either the country or the club. You know, so I think it's a win-win situation if that is done. Some of the um, some of the environments uh, around clubs, or, or be they sort of uh, training schemes, etc., don't necessarily encourage. Uh, don't actively discourage, but they won't. You know, the, the environment itself won't necessarily encourage parents to be be around all the time, be present at the sessions. There might not be you know, public viewing areas, etc. So, for me, uh, the key is actually if if a parent feels something that is not quite right, then we act on that. You know, for me, is if, if something doesn't feel right uh, about a, an arrangement that we've got, or something the child says something, you know, our own children have said something that doesn't feel quite right. It's explore it with the child, and then actually, if it is if it is an issue, then actually explore it with the club because the club should be open. Any well-run club should welcome questions from parents uh, about the welfare of their own children. Um, yeah, uh, you know, a, anything which actually, if if Clubs are actively barring people from actually viewing what's going on. That, for me, would raise a red flag. Uh, those kind of things. So, but um, you know, there's a lot of pressure at the moment, um, uh, and a lot of pressure on governing bodies, quite rightly, to um, make sure that forbidden conduct, i.e., you know, harassment or humiliation of children, doesn't occur. Um, so, the sport, you know, sports in general are going the right way to actually bring in those kind of. Um, you know, mandatory reporting, for example, and those kind of measures to make sure that people do report. So there's a there's a really really strong thrust to to actually make sure that people do speak up, do communicate. Uh, I'm aware that there can be uh, parents can worry about you know upsetting a coach, upsetting you know if if there were questions about that coach's attitude or communication or ability, etc. But actually, you know, we need to speak up because uh, the problems start compounding themselves if we don't say something and we're just bystanders. Yeah, so the the first session is what we call a needs analysis. So essentially asking lots of questions, getting to know that individual, getting to know wider factors around them so we can really build up a bigger picture to fully understand maybe why they're experiencing the reactions that they are and maybe where they're coming from. We have to be really cautious in psychology because I think especially with with youngsters, when they hear the word psychology, they can freak out. They can feel like we might be trying to read their mind or laying them down on a chaise long and delving into their deepest and darkest memories. 
And we really like to get across that sports psychology isn't about that. We're trying to help you perform better and enjoy it more at the same time. We like to keep it really simple, really light. So it's accessible because, you know, in the past, maybe it, there's been a bit of a taboo around speaking to a psychologist about speaking about this kind of area because it may come across like a weakness right it may seem that if you do admit to having negative thoughts and feeling lots of pressure and perhaps having anxiety then it's a weakness that you don't belong in that squad that the coach is going to perceive you as, as less and it's very important to recognize that's that's not the case and you know if you had a technical issue a coach would fix that right if you had a fitness issue you go in the gym and you work on that but too often we have a mental problem and we just assume that we're stuck that it's not changeable and that there's no point in doing something about it and that's very very wrong to assume that but what i was saying with how we treat that it's i'm always cautious using this this analogy but in a sense, not that it's as clinical. We want to make the sessions fun and engaging. But I guess the easiest comparison is almost like a doctor's appointment where you get a diagnosis and a prescription. So we might say, look, Freddie is having cognitive performance anxiety as a result of perfectionism and pressure from impressing his friends, perhaps. Once we can almost define what the problem is and where the causes and triggers and symptoms are coming from, we then better know how we can treat them, how we can help them, how we can improve them. So what it might look like as a as a kind of umbrella term to kind of what, what we generally do with performance anxiety is we'd look at what their intentions are, what the expectations and the pressure they're placing themselves under are. So a lot of the time with performance anxiety, we see what we call, what I like to call psychological swear words. So words like need, must, have to, should, right? They place this almost metaphorical backpack of pressure on us just by the language we use. And sometimes coaches use this language as well without knowing, you know, you need to perform well, we must get a PB, their intentions are great, but sometimes this this does pile on the pressure. Once we look at kind of the, the preconditions that an individual might be setting themselves, it's important to set them up with a framework so they understand and have something to fall back on, on how to deal with their thoughts, where they might target that, what they might actually do in them situations, because it's all well and good about talking about the anxiety and figuring out what's going on and the causes and triggers, but ultimately it's going to show up and often in the worst times. So it's very important to understand and have almost a mechanism and a, a plan in place of how you're going to deal with them thoughts, how you're going to deal with that physiological reaction, how you're going to deal with some of them adverse avoidance behaviours that come. I think the main thing for all sports is that often they are reactive rather than being proactive. So we see abuse in football from 2016, 17 onwards. But then we have to wait a number of years to see the abuse in gymnastics issue come out. And then more recently, abuse in swimming. Next year, it'd be abuse in cricket and some other sports. Sports should be proactive and should be learning from others where they failed or there's been issues. That's the first thing that should change. Secondly is independence and transparency is so key. Because if there's been a breakdown in trust, if someone suffered abuse, to expect them to trust that same institution which failed them initially to then do the right thing and to investigate and to punish their abusers, it isn't going to happen. It doesn't happen without that kind of support and therapy coming from an external body. So I think that those are some of the key things. Be proactive, be independent, be transparent and always put the athlete first. They must be the paramount concern because without the athletes, there is no sport. I've experienced bullying and it was a difficult time for me. 